Um, welcome, everyone. My name, for those of me that don't know me, is um, Diego Sánchez Ancochea. I'm the head of department at ODID in Oxford, um, and it's great to um, welcome you all. So I want to give you a, a short introduction as to why did we decided to do this, uh, and then I will move to Ken, um, who will chair the first um, session. So obviously, uh, as the world moved online, um, some of us um, got a little bit of press um, about the fact that we couldn't go um, to our office through, in our case, three months in road and continue our activities, but also realized that there's now a lot of potential to do things that would be harder, uh, including collaboration uh, among um, colleagues that uh, are in departments doing very much. that I knew the head of the department at LSE very well. He's a close friend, um, so uh, and he knew me. So it was a nice opportunity to try to collaborate. It's something that we could have done by traveling from London to Oxford and otherwise, but we had never um, quite thought to do. So um, it seems like uh, it's an exciting way to share ideas, to share communities, um, and to see and approach some of the same topics, but from a different perspective. Um, so we will have, as you might have seen, four of these sessions. Uh, it will be every other week. Um, this is the first one. Uh, and then the, uh, on the 14th uh, and the 28th, on the 11th of June, we have others on migration, um, on um, developments in Africa, and on health and human development. So I think it should be very interesting. It should be a great opportunity to share ideas. Uh, and maybe even from here, we have other ways of collaborating uh, between departments and between uh, people and think about some of the key issues of our time, but also from some more of a long-term perspective. So let me stop here, uh, move to Ken, uh, and then to the speakers. Great. Okay, thanks, Diego, and uh, welcome, everybody. Um, and thanks, Ben and Shalon, for agreeing to go first. Uh, um, appreciate it. Not much advance warning, and um, hopefully we'll get this off to a good start. I think everybody now is an expert on Zoom, so we don't need too many instructions yet. Just try to keep your microphones on mute, and then when it when you're not talking. Uh, we don't. I didn't activate a Q&A thing, because uh, I don't know how to do that. So if you have a question, just uh, say you have a question in the chat box, and then um, we can do that afterwards. Ben will go, and then Shilana will go, and then we'll do all the questions together at the end. The, this session is going to be is recorded. Uh, it's already being recorded, and that's really it. I mean, the last thing is whenever you give a we're, for a seminar, you know, we're not we're not expecting a fire alarm today. Uh, if there is a fire, I'll be exiting that way and then that way. And um, thanks, Ben. You should be able to share your screen. Over to you. Great. Thank you. Uh, yes. Let me just do the screen share. And just to start quickly as well by um, thanking both yourself, Ken and Diego for, I mean, as Diego, you were saying, I think we've all been seeing these kinds of spaces closed down for discussion and exchange in the last few months as workshops are canceled and conferences are canceled. So it's great to see these new spaces popping up, but they obviously don't just appear out of thin air and they involve a lot of work on behalf of the organizers. So thank you for that. Uh, so my job, well, today is just over the next 10 to 15 minutes, give you a very broad overview of the macroeconomic impact of COVID-19 in the global south as hopefully a platform for further discussion. So I'll review some of the major impacts and then consider also some of the possible policy responses that are available, as well as the progress that's been made towards these uh, to date. Just a few caveats, I think, when we talk about the fallout, uh, the economic fallout from COVID-19, that are worth mentioning. This figure I have up here is from a few years ago, but it's essentially showing that in 2017, there were 32 low middle income countries which had unsustainable or very high risk um, public debt profiles as assessed by the IMF, just to make the point that lots of what we're seeing now since the emergence of this global health pandemic is of course not entirely created by COVID-19, but nonetheless, I think, as, an, as far as external shocks go, it has been very significant for reasons that I'll go on to outline. And the other caveat is, of course, that there's great variance and heterogeneity in both the rapidity and the severity 
of this fallout across different regions and countries and their respective capacities to respond. And I'm not going to have time within this presentation to go into those, but it could be something that we might want to discuss afterwards. Um, but nonetheless, I thought it was quite striking that as early as April the 1st, 85 low and middle income countries had approached the IMF for short term emergency assistance. So within this heterogeneity, there's also some sort of uniformity here in terms of how countries are being affected in the global south. Some of these such as Ecuador and Zambia are already on the brink of default. And of course, the fear is that many others may soon join them if swift action is not taken. We're also seeing quite dramatic currency depreciations, double digits, 15, 20, 25, upwards of 30% in some cases, uh, raising inflationary pressures. This then, of course, leads to the question of why, what has been going on? over the last few months that has led to this situation. Lockdowns or the control of populations is of course part of the answer. And we've seen many, I was just reading an article this morning from the Financial Times of how many African countries have been extremely swift uh, and vigorous in responding to this in terms of closing borders and controlling the movement of their populations. And of course, this is part of the answer. But I think I have a list here of Four other factors that I think are particularly distinct to or more severe, felt more severely in the global south uh, as opposed to the global north that I think helps uh, explain what has been going on. And of course, there might be others which I've overlooked that we can, we can add in discussion. The first of these, which comes as no surprise, it's something that we always see, of course, at times of financial crisis and uncertainty and instability. Uh, is capital outflows. So I saw one report saying at the end of March, around $80 billion of stocks and bonds in low and middle income economies had uh, left those economies, uh, often returning, of course, to US, well, to safe currency havens, particularly the US dollar, the Swiss franc, the euro, the British pounds to some, some degree. Uh, and so some reports are saying these are historically unprecedented levels of capital outflows, of course, extremely damaging to those economies who yes. hemorrhage that capital. Yes. And we also need to ask who will benefit if China and the United States are really in public? Yeah, so I missed the second part of that question. Who will benefit? Shall I just carry on? Yeah, Ben, just carry on. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, and as I was, so of course, as these are leaving low middle income, middle income economies, they're also shoring up the capacity for stronger domestic responses uh, in those, the world's wealthiest countries who have been the recipient of those capital inflows. Another factor contributing here is the fall in demand for primary commodity exports. Again, something that we always see in these times. One of the reasons why, for example, Zambia is in such a vulnerable position, heavily dependent upon the export of copper, the demand of which and the price for which has been falling. And so for those countries who are heavily dependent upon the export of one or a few of these primary commodities, they're in a particularly vulnerable position as they lose a lot of that revenue on which they so heavily depend. Another factor is the disruption to foreign direct investment flows, uh, global trade and global value chains. Of course, there's gonna be a talk on this following my own, so I'm not gonna go into more detail here other than to note its significance. And lastly, I think it is also worth pointing to the fall in North-South remittances, which has been going on mm -hmm. primarily because many of the economic migrants from the Global South who working in the Global North are often in some of the most precarious forms of labor and have been amongst the first to lose those incomes and are no longer able to send money back to households uh, in the countries from which they come. And I saw one estimated fallout of $100 billion globally by the end of this year in remittance flows. And as one of the most, if not the most important by some estimates, capital inflows to low middle income economies this is obviously quite a significant issue. So the end result of all of this is that I think in quite marked contrast to some of the trillion dollar stimulus packages that we've seen being rolled out uh, from some of the world's wealthiest economies, the fiscal and monetary policy space for many countries in the global south is far more constrained. The IMF and UNCTAD put out 
an estimate of $2.5 trillion, which is going to be needed to help respond to the needs of low and middle income economies in the face of this global health pandemic, which then raises the obvious question of how do you find such an amount of money? And I've got here a list of six policy options that I'm going to go through. And of course, again, there may well be others that I've overlooked that, we, that, that can be discussed and should have been on this list. And I've ordered them in a very approximate estimation of how I think they configure in terms of their, their potential to fill this financing gap. The first of these is a debt moratorium, the, the idea that you essentially, for a certain defined period of time, suspend the servicing of all forms of debt. I saw the Rwandan president, Paul Kagame, a few days ago calling for a two-year moratorium on all of Rwanda's debt servicing, for example. Um, but from what I've seen, and I'm happy to um, to stand corrected on this, there's more recent information that I've missed, but it, the response so far seems to have been pretty meager compared to the potential here. The, uh, the IMF and the World Bank have pleaded for creditors to consider this, but all that I've seen concretely is half a billion dollars offered by the IMF in relief to 25 countries over the next six months. Another idea that is seemingly gaining increasing traction or at least uh, being advocated for and talked about by certain economists and policymakers is this idea of using IMF special drawing rights, which are essentially almost a form of a global currency, international reserve assets held by the IMF, which can then be exchanged for hard currency. So this, this could function really as a form of global quantitative easing. And during the North Atlantic financial crisis, I believe I'm right in saying $250 billion worth of special drawing rights were issued. I think they've been used four times since they were introduced in the late 60s. So they are very much reserved for times of crisis. And I think many feel that COVID-19 uh, represents that. There was on the table at the most recent spring meeting of the IMF a few weeks ago, a proposal to use um, half a trillion dollars for the IMF to issue half a trillion dollars worth of special drawing rights. This was vetoed by the US. Uh, and I, I believe also possibly India. In any case, it didn't pass, so it's currently off the table, but it may well, uh, I think the pressure for this may well increase as time goes on. Another possible option is the use of currency swap lines. This is something which, from what I can see, has generally been used between the world's wealthiest economies themselves, where you simply, it would really be a way of giving low middle income countries access to increased US, US dollar liquidity to help them with uh, imports or debt servicing and other needs where you essentially would swap swap their currencies with the US Federal Reserve for um, US dollars. What I've seen is $60 billion being made available to Brazil and Mexico from low middle income country groupings. And I wouldn't be holding my breath necessarily for this to be used in a significant way uh, or to, to expand significantly, but nonetheless, there is, uh, I think it does have the potential to provide uh, some response if it, would be, if it were to be considered more widely. But of course, I think the issue here is that the US Federal Reserve is reluctant probably to provide too much of this to, to weaker or more volatile currencies. Then there's the emergency assistance, which I was talking about earlier, that many countries have been looking for from the international financial institutions. The IMF, I think, has doubled from 50 billion to 100 billion, the emergency assistance it can make available and has been distributing that uh, quite rapidly. The World Bank has said it can provide up to $160 billion over the next 15 months. So these are significant sums, of course, and welcome announcements, but in the face of the 2.5 trillion seem somewhat meager. Another option is to capitalize national and multilateral development banks. For example, I saw recently that the African Development Bank released a $10 billion response facility. This is something that was used as a policy, again, following the North Atlantic financial crisis of 07 and 08. I think the National Development Bank of China holds $2 trillion worth of assets, and so there may be things that could be done here that could be helpful. And lastly, capital controls to try and um, limit the degree to which uh, countries in the Global South are hemorrhaging lots of capital. Of course, there's the extent to which the horse may already have bolted on this one, and it has been off the table and certainly hasn't been being discussed at the most recent spring meetings just a few weeks ago held by the IMF and the World Bank. So the answer then to the question of how to find this money would seem to be with great difficulty. And Jose Ocampo, who has been following this all closely, uh, recently commented that the response at the multilateral level 
has been distinctly underwhelming relative to the need and relative to the response that was seen following the North Atlantic financial crisis just over a decade ago. And I think he's right when he characterizes the response globally as being represented by very ambitious domestic policies rolled out in the world's wealthiest countries alongside a pretty poor and feeble response at the multilateral level, considering how to support uh, countries in the global south on the economic fallout from this. And I would just close by giving my own personal caveat, which is particularly because there are many of you in here who don't necessarily know me. Um, you know, my own research is not necessarily deeply focused on issues of debt servicing or liquidity financing, liquidity issuing. And I'm saying that partly so I don't look a complete fool if somebody asks me to describe the finer details of currency swaps, but also because I'd be very interested to hear from people who might look at these things more closely, what, what they think of these particular policy options, to what extent they might be able to play a useful role here. And of course, there are others that I've overlooked that should have been on this list. Thank you. Thanks, Pat. Great. Um, so, D stop sharing? Yes. Yeah, cool. All right. Uh, Sean? No, you're, you're muted still. Okay, yeah. Um, many thanks to Diego and Ken for organizing this uh, very innovative initiative. And uh, I believe there will be uh, more collaboration, more innovative ideas come from the two institutions after this unfortunate pandemic. Uh, we try to, you know, uh, make some uh, uh, new things uh, uh, at this difficult time. And uh, um, I will build upon uh, Ben's excellent uh, overview about the macroeconomic impact of the uh, corona virus, uh, and uh, I will focus on the impact of the pandemic uh, on global trade and the value chain. So I also prepared some slides, uh, and uh, I will share mine. Yes, yeah. So what's the impact? What's the impact of the uh, pandemic? Um, WTO predicts that the world trade overall will fall um, up to a third of the, uh, uh, in, 20, in 2020. So the overall trade will fall by 22% by the maximum uh, and due to the uh, disruptions to the global value chain, to global economic activity and to our normal life. Uh, and the, in terms of commodity trade, uh, WTO predicts the, the, the decrease will be up to half, uh, 50%. So that is about the impact on trade. That will be a dip. Uh, and the, in terms of FDI, foreign direct investment, according to UNCTAD, um, UNCTAD projects that the downward pressure on global FDI will be in the range of uh, 30 to 40 percent leading up to 2020. So uh, also it's between 30 to 40 percent uh, decrease in FDI. And looking at the global value chain, the activities, uh, the trades um, along the value chain, UNCTAD early in March already predicts um, the coronavirus has cost global value chain of 50 billion US dollar already. And uh, at that time, the, the pandemic has not spread wide, has just spread it uh, uh, globally. So nowadays, looking at the global value chain, the damage uh, will be several times of that. And the consequence of the, the decrease in trade, in, 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 in uh, disruption in global value chain is income. The decrease of uh, 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 the fall in income, the loss of jobs, the fluctuation in prices, some prices which there is a, 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 a strong need, uh, demand, and we will see the price go up. And for some uh, um, commodities, because lack of the demand, the price will go down. So 
we'll see uh, kind of fluctuations uh, in, in prices. And also, as a consequence of the jobs, job loss and the income uh, decrease, then we'll see increasing inequalities and poverty. So that's the consequence, inequality, poverty, loss of jobs and incomes. And how does the pandemic, the, the coronavirus, hits glo global trade and the global value chain? It hits the global trade in three uh, uh, channels, three dimensions. First is the disruption to the transportation. Uh, more than 60% of global trade now are accounted for by uh, uh, global value chain. So the production uh, in the past 20 uh, decades, especially, the multinationals ha have sliced the whole production process into uh, fine pieces and they relocate these small pieces in different locations in different countries in order to maximize the profits, in order to maximize the profits. So a normal T-shirt, a, a, a sweater, or a, a, a normal bag can be, you know, the material, the production, the assembly, the branding, the marketing kind of distributed in various countries, scattered in various countries. And the logistics is very important, the supply chain. And this disruption in, uh, to transportation because the countries have uh, uh, adopted various response measures uh, from uh, border control uh, to closing the ports, air, uh, um, uh, airports and, 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 uh, and um, marine uh, ports, uh, and also uh, about internal uh, 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 movement controls, like in some large countries, internal uh, movement uh, restrictions. All these bring a disruption to the supply chain. And in the supply chain, any part of the chain, when it is blocked, all the afterwards uh, production activity will be affected. Then we see, the, 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 like in Japan, the, the car manufacturer has to close because they don't have stock and the spare parts, even one spare part is missing, they cannot f uh, finalize the production. The second is about disruption to, uh, pro to production. So in addition to the supply chain disruption, and there are other measures introduced, like the closure of workplaces, uh, workplaces a closure of public transportation. Even the workplace not uh, rigidly uh, uh, closed. Uh, if the public transportation is closed, people cannot go to work. And also many people have to stay at home according to government's requirement. So the factor inputs uh, for production are, uh, are disrupted. Uh, thirdly, it's a fall in demand. The fall in demand was not significant in February and January, when only China was the, the, uh, was the um, epicenter. But from March onwards, we see globally uh, in the spread of the virus, demand fall is very sharp. So uh, a lot of uh, factories, like the, the, the garment factories in Sri Lanka, in Bangladesh, the orders are cancelled. Orders are cancelled. So even in Africa, the pandemic are not that kind of severely outbreak, but the orders are cancelled from the global north. So this affects the whole global value chain. However, the impact of the, the pandemic uh, have different impacts, uh, have different impacts uh, on different sectors and in different countries. So the factors that affect the, the, the degree of impact uh, in general, first, depending on the, the characteristics of the sector. If the sector is more contact intensive, and it will be affected. Like the, the, in the retail sector, uh, um, hotels or barbershop, the hair, the, the, the hair salon, that's heavily uh, uh, affected because intense uh, contact. Uh, between customer and the services provider. However, in the short, uh, supermarkets or in financial sector or business consulting, they can move uh, to online and the uh, contact is not intensive and they are less like uh, the, the degree of the impact is less. And also the fragmentation uh, of the value chain. The value chain is less fragmented, less affected. It's more affected like the electronics industry 
the impact is very significant. And the dig digitization degree uh, of the country and of the, the uh, sector and of the company. The companies that are more digitized, automatized, and then they have less worker, they need less worker. They can do more of the production online. And uh, those um, companies, either manufacturing or services, they are less likely to uh, be affected, like in the in the city, uh, in, in in London, many of the the business services and the financial companies they are still running online, and finally policy measures, the quarantine measures measures uh, adopted by by government, from very strict uh, measures like in China, and to much more kind of flexible measures in the U.S. or in in the U.K. Um, and uh, that will have different uh, impact uh, on the country, on the economy. And therefore, the impact on the services sector and, uh, and the manufacturing sector are different. different. And within the services sector, some contact in, in intensive sector are, are kind, of, kind of being killed. Tourism, a hotel. However, um, in some of sectors like business services or retail, they move online, they move online. And, uh, and uh, some new services developed uh, uh, during the pandemic. And because the countries have different industrial structure, in the north, global north, most of the countries are more a, a services economy, like US, UK, 80, 70, 80% of the GDP and the job come from the services sector. They are less likely, uh, um, and, um, they're less affected. Uh, in, uh, in comparison to those countries mainly based on manufacturing. Um, of course, in the, in the low-income countries, they, are, they don't have business services. They don't have digitization. They will also be heavily affected. And in, that's uh, in the developing country. Um, manufacturing intensive, or they don't have uh, a digital infrastructure, or their business, their services are mainly uh, hotels, restaurants, etc. They will be uh, affected, and they don't have the digital infrastructure for all this to to happen. So, developing countries, uh, in my view, will be hit um, also uh, heavily uh, when the, there is an outbreak. Uh, in addition to all these factors, there are other factors affecting the developing countries. Um, this pandemic overall deepened the trend before the pandemic, the major trend. What are the major trends? First is the fourth industrialization and automation. Uh, digitization. That's the technical progress, technical revolution. The second one is the wave of deglobalization, uh, nationalism. Uh, um, so this wave, that, that's the second wave. The third wave is the trade war. It's a trade war. So these uh, three major trends are all being deepened, accelerated uh, um, um, due to the pandemic, due to the pandemic. The business are now thinking about changing their business model. They are increasing the automation and the digitization. That's, that is one. Secondly, it's about global value chain. They are trying to make the global value chain more regionalized or even localized. So the reassuring reassuring back to the industrialized countries, back to the global north, supported by technology, supported by automation, is going to take place. It's going to take place. So this is another, this is one uh, change. And uh, secondly, is this uh, pandemic also sparks some kind of thinking about self economic self-sufficiency. Self People talk about state economy, uh, the country is doing things, that, uh, kind of self-independence, and uh, some people talk, talking about even very strongly suggesting a deglobalization uh, process. Although I, I disagree, but that's op one of the opinion, uh, opinions so far. Uh, and uh, in addition to all this, Another thing is the U.S.-China relationship. Uh, there was a trade war. Uh, there is a trade war. Uh, and, uh, and this relationship, unfortunately, has not been kind of improved uh, because of the virus that we need to fight together. Uh, 
Now it's really, uh, yesterday I was in another webinar uh, with the, some senior U.S. Um, uh, scholars. Um, they all agree that it's the worst time, worst time in, um, in past 30, uh, 40 years. So all these major economies will have impact on the development. The whole economic environment will deteriorate in many ways. The opportunity window for the low-income countries to catch up really narrowed. narrowed. So what, what are the policy choices? The policy choices um, for the developing countries and actually for all the countries first is to use technology and use science to combat the, 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 the virus, combat the, the pandemic. But we see a lot of application of digital technology to use e-business, e-doctor, e-learning, uh, etc. Um, to uh, combat the pandemic. That is one uh, practice that we have seen. Secondly, these countries need to really think about more uh, flexible quarantine measures. Like in, uh, I think the strictest, uh, most strict one, uh, robust one uh, being uh, adopted is, was in China. But that really cut um, of the, the, the bring, almost bring the economy kind of down for more than one month. Uh, um, so different, you know, consider different uh, measures at different times really uh, will help. Uh, thirdly, is develop new, new value chains. I think that's an opportunity for all countries, including the developing countries. The digital sector will, you know, because the need to combat the virus, the digital services uh, uh, and the digitization really helped uh, bring a new sector. Secondly, is the new value chain in providing public health. So the, the face masks, the sanitizers, a lot of um, PPEs, uh, we should help the developing countries to build up their uh, local production capacity. And through international collaboration, through a technology transfer and aid. And uh, this could be a new value chain, a new value chain to help um, the health, improve the health situation in the developing countries. Thirdly, uh, the green economy. Yeah, um, if anything to promote the economic growth, I think should combine this with the green transformation so that you know, all this in one go uh, towards sustainable development. And finally, uh, because of the, the deteriorating uh, uh, macroeconomic environment and the global uh, trade wars, the reforms of globalization make it more fair, uh, more inclusive, uh, is also a, a, a very important step. So that's all from me. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, ben, Shalom, thank you both very much. So I will ac accumulate questions, or people could just let me know if they have questions, and I'll unmute you, or you can unmute yourself. Um, I, I, I'll start, but I, I'm happy to, I'm always happy to talk. I have a question for each of you. My question for, um, my question for Ben is if, you could say a little bit more about what the the 2.5 trillion is supposed to be spent on, because one of the things that I found so frustrating about this whole 2.5 trillion dollar discussion is that it's it's saying what countries need, it's the amount of flow capital that countries need to have, but it it says to, it seems to be done without any con, without any attention paid to what that money is going to be spent on. So there's other parts of the global economy that might affect that, for example. Well, if they're going to be using some of that money to buy uh, immediately during the pandemic to buy sort of medical devices or ventilators or something, there's other aspects of the global economy that will affect how much those things cost as well. So $2.5 trillion can get you a lot or it can get you a little, depending on what you're buying. My question for Shalon is sort of something that came up at the very end of your presentation, which it seems like there's a trade-off. Because on the one hand, some of the things that you were presenting at the very end of your slide about sort of building building new different types of global value chains, those things will take a long time. You can't just build those overnight, but a long time means a much longer time that these economies are basically suffering from the crisis, from the essentially the disruption of their normal export markets. So you sort of have a trade-off in that 
in order for, it almost sounds like what you're saying is that in order for the countries to do the things that you think, to, to exploit opportunities, the crisis has to be really bad and have to go on for a long time. And then if it's too short of a crisis, there won't be enough time to sort of exploit these opportunities in these creative ways and build different types of global value chains. And so I'm just wondering if you see uh, any of a tension there. Um, So, uh, so oh, yeah, okay, Ben, yeah, please, yeah. Uh. Yeah, sorry, I was just struggling to find my mute button. Um, yeah, thanks, Ken. So the two and a half trillion, and maybe this is what you've seen as well, but my understanding of it was one trillion dollars of special drawing rights, one trillion dollars in debt cancellation, uh, sorry, debt cancellations, or <clears throat> uh, debt moratorium, and 500 billion dollars of investment going to health services and social relief programs uh, in the global south. But of course, you're right. I mean, the mix of this is, is critical. And of course, the one of the advantages of special drawing rights, I think, is that it would be unconditional. It wouldn't come with potential kind of austerity conditions that might come with other forms of IMF or World Bank financing. But that's how I've seen it being broken down, if that answers your question. Yeah, I, I don't really buy the debt moratorium part, but that's another issue, yeah. yeah okay. Good. Um, yeah, uh, thanks, Ken, for the, for, for the question. I think the response, overall response to the pandemic, I think will, should be a package, a package combining fiscal policy, monetary policy, and also uh, industry policy. And uh, more short-term, a uh, quick response will come from monetary policy and, uh, and, and fiscal policy. That's uh, what we have seen in some countries, to, like, uh, um, uh, like Ben said, the, the stimulus package and also, uh, also fiscal policy about um, uh, uh, reduced interest rate uh, um, uh, exemption of the tax and also uh, providing subsidy to small business and also to households and also to the workers who cannot go to job or who lose job. So these are the short uh, um, term uh, um, action to save uh, the economy and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, help people and, uh, and the business. So once they are there, when the economy and the demand recovers, they can respond more quickly. Uh, oh. And, uh, and at the same time, the industry policy part is about building the, 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 the new chains. Uh, because these new chains, especially the digital chain and also the public health chain, they are very, very much needed during the fight against the, the uh, COVID-19. Because when we are in quarantine, uh, the e-business help us to get the food. Uh, help us to get the services, um, or help our kids to, to learn something using the, the, yeah. Uh, yeah. So these are kind of, uh, there are <laughs> demands during the, 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 the kind of uh, pandemic uh, period. And also, um, like the public health part, um, um, face masks, sanitizers, all these, they are, they are not high tech products. And uh, so they should be some, um, uh, some products, the value chain, that developing countries will be able to build up uh, um, through international support and international collaboration. So these are the ones that are, there is a large demand, huge demand uh, um, uh, during the pandemic. And uh, uh, the production technology is not very sophisticated. Um, we are not talking about uh, ventilators, but more the, the basic PPEs. Uh, and uh, so this could be ones. And, um, and the others will be in the more kind of, exactly as you said, it's kind of a medium or, or long term. Mm, but uh, public health and the digital, some of the, the uh, will be very helpful to combat the pandemic. Great. Thanks both. There's a couple of questions in the, in the, in the uh, chat, and then I, I saw one person has their hand up. So first, the question from the chat was for you, Sholan, which is, with regard to the disintegration of GVCs, do you think that this will go back to, the no to normal in the future, or do you think this is a lasting change? So, um, I think this change, um, I don't think it will go back. 
it's will um, will be a uh, uh, in my view uh, because this is strengthened this kind of by three forces. First is the automation and fourth industrial revolution uh, about the, the reshoring. Second is about the deglobalization and the nationalism, uh, and uh, so this is another uh, 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 kind of force that push uh, this change. And the, the pandemic then add another, uh, 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 the pandemic add another, because this shock together with the, uh, the, the, like the actions, policies, measures taken by the U.S. in kind of cutting off the supply chain to some of the Chinese manufacturers. Really, uh, for the multinationals, the manufacturers, they realize political influence, political action, plus this pandemic, the, the virus, can really cut off the value chain. So the sustainability of the value chain, some people call sustainability or the diversification of the value chain or localization of the value chain to reduce the risk uh, will be a kind of uh, 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 important change that I don't see a much reason to reverse back. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, Kate, you have your hand up? Yes, can you hear me? Okay. Um, yeah, thank you very much for two really interesting presentations. Um, I think I, I want to follow on on what uh, Ken said, uh, particularly this, what's this 2.5 trillion supposed to be spent on? Um, yesterday, I listened to an uh, International Growth Center um, webinar, and they were focusing very much on the public health side, and were very keen on the development vaccines and therapeutics and uh, various types of supplies and the need for huge amounts of money in order to provide these various things for African countries. But one of the things that came out uh, talking to, well, in the presentation of uh, Ngozi Okonjiwala, who was talking about uh, what needs to be done and how money needs to be used, is, and perhaps Ken can come in on this one, the talk of vaccines was about providing appropriate incentives for the private sector through Gavi to create these vaccines and therapeutics, which is going to be a hugely expensive way of producing whatever kinds of necessary drugs. Um, so I'm wondering how much this 2.5 trillion is really gauged around trying to use this pandemic as a private sector opportunity um, to lend money to African countries or developing countries in trouble to then um, have that money be absorbed by various um, private sector pharmaceutical companies, digital um, companies, the tech service to build infrastructure and help countries move online. Is there anything in here that talks about actually a more indigenous uh, economic response to the crisis in the ways in which, for example, after the war or during the war, Latin America used it as a huge opportunity to become uh, much more economically independent, much more self-sufficient. So um, I'm wondering, I guess, whether there is anything in what you've read that suggests how this money is actually, what's the economic model through which this money is going to be absorbed? What are the companies and sectors that stand to gain from that? And is there any alternative perspective that looks at ways in which developing countries could actually use a whole lot less money to do things or engage in ways that are um, more supportive of their own capacity and autonomy and uh, embed them less in a huge web of debt, which is already pretty extreme in a lot of places? Thanks. Either of you want to respond? Sure. Uh, ben, will, will you respond? Whoever wants to, you guys can sort of fight it among oh, yeah. yourselves. Ben, Ben's on yeah. mute, so I guess, Sholan, you're responding. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think this is a very good question. Um, really, I, I have seen uh, Anktex um, um, uh, kind of proposing this 2.5 uh, trillion, and uh, and how to use it. Whether there is an economic model. Um, 
so far, I have not seen a, a convincing or, or widely accepted um, um, model about this. But in my view, um, like the, the, right, the production of vaccination, and this should come from a kind of specialized funding port. And uh, this uh, um, uh, architect uh, proposed 2.5 trillion, I think should go for uh, saving in the economy. Because if we do not save the economy, a lot of people will die because of hunger. And uh, that number of deaths will be even larger than the people die from uh, the virus. Uh, that's what we have seen in China because uh, the, the quarantine that uh, have been introduced really kind of made the economy just stopped. All the streets are, by, are only two, uh, on the two ends of the, each street there are people checking and the, between the provinces people cutting off, dig out the roads and cut off the transportation and the, and the, and um, even doctors were, were, were calling uh, for, uh, you know, uh, need proper measures, uh, not overdone. So we need to balance um, the cost and, uh, and uh, I think need to combine this together. Now, I personally, I, I, I think use all this for vaccination, uh, then we will see people die from hunger. Wait, ben, has Ben disappeared? He's moved off my screen. Diego, you have your hand raised. Sorry, I don't mean to shout. It seems like everyone's far away. Uh, Diego, you have your hand raised. Yes, I had a question for Ben, which I will actually write in the chat in case he comes back. Um, and one for Sholan, which is, yes. Sholan, could you tell us a little bit more about uh, how you think China is going to evolve in terms of both the politics, but especially the political economy model? So obviously China, right before the crisis, was gradually moving towards a more uh, domestic driven model. Um, yeah. So will, will the current skepticism that you were describing at the about the global value chain lead to an even deepening on that model? So that's my first question. But the second is that of course China now has its own multinational corporations which are also participating in global value chains in Asia. How do you think they will respond? So companies like Huawei, etc., will now be more skeptical and try to have all their production based in China or do you have a sense of what will happen? And again, I have another question for Ben, but I think it's just better if I write it in the, in the chat. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Diego. I think uh, these two are very, very good questions because the first one uh, really is the, a big question for, for China now to, to, to think about. Uh, but I, in my view, China, this will deepen. This will deepen the, 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 the transition of the development strategy. Um, China used a kind of outward oriented uh, export promotion and development strategy uh, during the first kind of 30 years of the uh, reforms. And uh, uh, gradually, um, because of the, 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 um, uh, the pressure in the international markets, because of the trade war, Already they were thinking about, they, they should, they should promote domestic consumption and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and stimulate consumption and, uh, and use this as an important driver uh, for economic growth and, the, and the development. And also the transition to a more knowledge driven uh, instead of a kind of resource driven economy. Uh, so this is on, on, uh, before the, 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 the pandemic. And this pandemic and also the deteriorating, rapidly deteriorating uh, international political uh, environment for China, I think strengthened uh, this trend about they need to promote a kind of uh, stimulate domestic consumption and, and the change to a consumption, domestic consumption uh, uh, driven uh, uh, growth mo model. And so I, I think this will, will deepen. And my worry is that, my worry is that um, the unfavorable uh, in deteriorating external environment will stimulate some nationalism. And some people were thinking, uh, okay, the external world dislike us, uh, they will decoupling from us, and we have to do everything. And that's not for the world, not for the country. Uh, 
uh, but I, I, I'm, I'm afraid currently there are kind of uh, the, the, the more liberal oh, um, uh, group cam, camp of people within China and the other more left uh, uh, wing um, uh, uh, camp of China, inside China. Uh, I think still kind of, uh, I think is, at the moment is, there is a debate uh, going on. And for Chinese multinationals, um, I, I think the pandemic uh, does affect the investment because uh, some of the investments, all, uh, they cannot, cannot took place because of an pandemic. Uh, they cannot be implemented or uh, the workers um, uh, cannot go to the place, uh, go, going abroad. Um, so that was the impact on China's uh, OFDI. Uh, then China quickly recovered and uh, kind of want to move forward and the external environment get changed. Uh, however, I think openness, um, kind of stick to openness, what I have seen, observed in the past two, three years until now, is um, support globalization, support multilateralism, uh, is something that the Chinese government has been sticked firmly too, and they are talking about high level of uh, openness. So um, even during the very difficult time of the trade war, so I, uh, China benefits from globalization. Uh, therefore, I think China, uh, in terms of OFDI, uh, it will, um, from China's side, the motivation is still there. The motivation is still there, but depends on the, the whole um, international environment. Uh, for that to take place. Thank you. So, Ben, you're back. Good. I'm glad you're here. There's a couple of questions in the chat that maybe you can um, address. One of them is from David asking whether or not there's something, the particularities of the external shock that come from COVID-19 relative to the external shocks that brought about debt crises in the 80s and 90s. And then one is from Diego asking you to dig in, share a little bit of your expertise in the area of the world where you do research about what countries are doing, to what extent we see any diversity, and to what extent you think that some countries have more than other sort of uh, economic and political space to be creative. Yeah, thank you. And sorry for disappearing there. I had, um, yeah, my, my two-year-old daughter pulled my Wi-Fi connector out of the socket. So apologies to everyone for suddenly disappearing offline. Um, and yeah, so I wasn't able to answer your question, Kate. Uh, but yeah, since conversation has moved on. Uh, so the question on the particularities of the COVID-19 external shocks, is that what relative to previous in the 1980s, what's particular about it? Uh, David, if you're around, if you want to follow up and clarify, yeah. I'm just reading off my screen. Oh, yeah, I can't see them anymore since I logged back in. They all disappeared. The question said, the Latin American debt crisis came from the oil shock. The Asian financial crisis came from a range of shocks from currencies, et cetera. Mm. But the underlying problems were also a massive unsustainable debt and external account structures. Do the speakers see the COVID-19 shock creating very heightened risk of financial sovereign debt banking system crises from the global south? And if so, from which regions? Yeah, I mean, absolutely, I think. I think it goes back to what I was saying at the start in the sense that COVID-19 is kind of a shock on top of many other shocks. I, I mean, I remember talking to, with my students just a few weeks before we started talking about COVID-19 about the oil price collapse. And so it's one in a series. And I think, yeah, it does create uh, extremely heightened risks due to the potential severity and longevity of this in the sense that, you know, historically shocks have been somewhat more short-lived. And this particular shock, we don't yet know for how long it, it may continue and at what depth. And so, and this sort of links to your question as well, Diego, in terms of which countries and regions might be more or less vulnerable. Of course, the oil exporters, this is, um, you know, I've been looking at Republic of Congo, for example, uh, who are already before COVID-19 facing a very difficult situation given the situation with the oil price or Angola or whoever it might be. This is why we see also Ecuador in so much difficulty. So I think these countries that are heavily dependent upon these primary commodity exports, be it oil or, or others, are going to be the ones which have the most restrained and restricted policy space to do something about this and are going to be the most constrained. Whereas I think those which have more diversified, more domestically anchored, more domestically oriented economies should have 
uh, a little bit more, or regional economies for that matter, should have a little bit more space uh, relative to relative to those which which don't. Okay, I, um, I have two. I don't think I'm missing anybody. So there's also a couple of questions here. Um, uh, I guess it was my job as chair uh, to read off my screen. So these are two questions for Laura Mann. Um, one is for Shalon and one is for Ben. And the question that Laura has for you, Shalon, is a China question. And she wants to know whether or not um, sort of related to China, digital projects in China to create databases that might allow Chinese tech, tech companies to develop. Her question is, are you aware of any policies explicitly in China or perhaps the U.S. or elsewhere to use the pandemic and the extra tracking and surveillance imperatives as an opportunity for AI development and industrial policy, either in health or other areas of, um, so that's interesting question. And the question that for Ben is from Laura is, uh, are there any African governments giving economic relief to particular groups, for example, people within the informal economy, and whether there is any kind of increasing data collection going on in order to target debt relief. Um, yeah, that's something that uh, I've been interested in as well. Yeah, so those are the questions. Uh, thanks, Laura. This is another uh, very timely question. And uh, actually, now in China, uh, I think it's since end of February, um, the government has introduced a new policy to strengthen the new infrastructure. They call new infrastructure. This new infrastructure mainly refer, refers to the digitalization-based infrastructure, like the 5G, uh, like the, the blockchain, uh, like the artificial intelligence, all those uh, there is now a very kind of uh, rigorous definition that given by the government what they mean by this new new uh, infrastructure. And so this, there is a kind of, um, in a way, this is like an industrial policy being uh, introduced as a response because they see digital technology will help to overcome the future shocks like pandemic or like uh, other disruptions to the supply chain or, or, or um, uh, uh, logistics, etc. And also this uh, will help build a new industry, like the e-learning, uh, 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 telehealth uh, services. All these become booming in China. So some uh, companies really make made money uh, uh, from this. So there is kind of a new uh, uh, policy being introduced. We can say it's an industrial policy, but different from what we think about chi China's uh, industrial policy is that following that, uh, the government introduced another document to say strengthen the role of market in the relocation of uh, allocation of the uh, resources, which means they are not going to use uh, the government kind of uh, a traditional tool to, to allocate uh, the resources, the funding, they are going to let the market to distribute. Uh, so, but in a way, I think kind of uh, um, uh, relate to uh, uh, the question that you are asking. Yeah, and yeah, thank you, Laura, for the question. I've also been interested in this. And I haven't seen, I mentioned earlier how many of the African countries have been having pretty effective and rapid responses in terms of things like social distancing and travel restrictions, curfews, wearing masks, and so on. But I've yet to see anything myself in terms of, yeah, actual targeted support to vulnerable groups. I'd be very interested to hear from others, if others are aware of those sorts of policies. But I think this is precisely the one of the issues, right, is the sense that for, you know, many of these countries, this is precisely the difficulty, particularly where you have very widely expanded labor informality, very relatively low percentages of the population in formal sectors, uh, is precisely how, how do you provide this sort of support if you don't have, if you're in these financial difficulties, where's that money going to come from? How are you going to roll it out? How's it going to reach people who need it? And so I think this is, again, one of the very uneven ways in which this is going to roll out in between 
um, between the global north and the global south is that I think, particularly in countries where so many people are living hand to mouth uh, and are no longer able necessarily to uh, engage in the economic activity they were engaging in previously, and there's an absence of uh, meaningful social support coming from the government, uh, that is going to obviously be uh, an extremely difficult situation for, for many. But again, you know, I'd be interested to hear if other people are aware of examples where we have seen African governments rolling out this sort of social assistance, but I haven't come across anything myself yet. Are there other questions in the queue or anybody wants to raise their hand and ask questions? Anybody? Did I miss anything? Okay. Um, oh, Kate, yes, fire away. Sorry, am I audible? Yes. Okay, I, I want to articulate a, a little better um, what I was thinking of picking up on, on some of the ideas here. Really, the, a lot of people when this thing started, at least in the UK, were thinking that what this is driving is an intensification of a focus on the public sector and the role of the public sector in especially public health, um, but in nationalizing um, and railways, etc. There was a sense that this might tip towards public sector expansion. But from what some of you are saying, there's also a, a sense that some people are trying to tip this much more in uh, the direction of private sector expansion. Xiaolan said uh, the Chinese government is, is indicating this should be uh, expanding investment should be driven by the private sector. Um, the talk about uh, vaccines and medical supplies really does focus very much on a private sector-led approach. In fact, I heard this morning that um, the vaccine they're trying to produce in Oxford is actually being produced through a, a consortium, a partnership between um, uh, Oxford University and I've forgotten the name of this private uh, drug company with... Um... Accenture. Sorry? Uh, AstraZeneca. Yes, AstraZeneca, that's right. Um, so uh, that's, this always makes me think of the way in which this insulin came about, which is a university came up with, the University of Toronto, in fact, came up with uh, a, a, an important new piece of uh, medical knowledge, and they sold it into the public sector for $1.00. So there are very different models of how to respond to this pandemic. And one is getting a sense that what looks on the surface as though it is tipping us more towards the public, the increased role of the public sector, um, one is wondering under the surface, these calls for resources and restructuring of global value chains and rethinking of the, um, the structure of economies in developing countries, do either of you see this as tipping us more towards increasing nationalization and public uh, role for the public sector or more towards a privatization, an ongoing intensifying privatization of economies and health and um, infrastructure, et cetera? Um, uh, ben, would you like to go first or I go? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I think, and of course, if we look, I mean, it's a very relevant question. I've been thinking about this myself. And if we look at the, you know, the 07, 08 crisis, it seems that it was very much the latter, right, in the sense of whether it, which way it tipped the balance. And while there has been a lot of noise being made around the degree to which, as you say, with the turning more to state-led models, state, state intervention in markets, uh, I would also, if I pick up on your own leaning towards this, kind of share your concern in the sense I think... Sorry, I just had some big feedback. I think, um, yeah, I mean, my, my suspicion would be this is probably going to lead more towards the private, private financing, private sector response, particularly, you know, we can see how keen private sector is already to, kill the, to fill this financing gap, talked about in relation to the sustainable development goals. 
And whenever there's talk of a financing gap, it does seem to be inevitably private sector, which often will come forward uh, and provide that. And so is there enough within this to suggest that this will be a tipping point which moves things in a different direction? Of course, there's, there's, there's that possibility. We, you know, this is a pretty unprecedented situation and it is raising that key debate that is always ongoing between you know states states and markets the degree in which they relate to each other and i think at the moment it's very early isn't it to, to sort of get a proper feel for that but as you say there are many indications which would seem to point towards this being perhaps more strengthening of private private finance and private institutions while it has a veneer of state-led responses over the surface but actually the substance of that might be uh, might, might prove to be in time somewhat limited yeah. I, I think, uh, Kate, this is really a question you need us to, to think. It, it's a, a quite deep question. Um, I think that different countries have different contexts. In the context of China, is a, um, a country with, uh, with a, a strong state presence and a more kind of visible hand of the state uh, in the economy. And uh, uh, the problem... And I think the government realized the problem is that in the old way, this new funding will go to the state-owned sector or go to the big companies who are already kind of, you know, uh, um, beneficiaries uh, uh, of, uh, of the existing policies. So um, in this, I think this is a signal that they want to support a more private sector, the uh, SMEs, etc., and uh, and uh, and therefore kind of uh, moving the country from a more stronger state uh, 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 kind of managed economy to a more kind of marketized uh, economy. In the case of the UK, uh, I don't know the government's overall plan, like. Um, the production and the, uh, the production, uh, the technology transfer and production, if we engage with the private sector, if later the provision of the, the vaccination still have to go, still go through the NHS provided by uh, the public sector, um, then this may all still remain uh, in the public sector, although the production process uh, kind of engage uh, with uh, the private sector in kind of PPP model, public-private partnership model. So uh, in this case, it's not fully uh, released. I cannot comment too much. And But also yesterday, there is a, a, one of the major uh, policy advisors in the U.S. He wrote an article just two weeks ago to say the case for an industrial strategy for the United States. Uh, I think that's kind of very kind of change. He is arguing that uh, the state cannot, markets alone cannot so address all the challenges of market failure, etc. And there is a role for the state to introduce an industrial strategy. Um, I, I think that's a good sign for the two sides to see some kind of policy convergence or the, the learning from each other, uh, re recognize the limitations of the existing system and make some improvements. If this can go in, uh, on, then I see some mutual learning and the convergence and the more understanding. Uh, I hope that's my, my, my goodwill, but I also hope this will really <laughs> happen. Sorry. Fantastic. Um, are there any other hands raised that I'm missing or questions? I'm just looking through the uh, comments, the chat here. Um, okay, well, um, Diego, do you have any final words? Oh, wait. Laura Mann, maybe I have a question. This is like the seminar. We don't want the students to leave. We could just end. We don't have to stick it out till 4.30. Ah, Laura wants to know what is the best way to keep track of the impacts on trade? Shalon, what is the best way to keep track of the impacts on trade? Um, first is we, um, like WTO and UNCTAD have, um, you know, kept on making uh, predictions and, and, and the publication of the data. And I think first, 
data, publication of data, open access and the shared data is one of the uh, 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 reliable data, uh, one of the most important steps. Uh, and another is that we need to make some rigorous economic assessment, economic assessment of the impact of the pandemic on trade. And uh, therefore, one of the projects Diego knows I proposed to Oxford University is to make a kind of economic uh, estimation of the, the, the impact and the, the policy measures introduced by governments uh, on, on, on the trade and the production. What we are going to do is use the 20, 2003 SARS, the SARS impact on China's uh, value chain, China's um, um, part of the global value chain, and use that as a kind of um, a, a, a baseline, and then we create a synthetic uh, China uh, in 2020. Um, then we adjust the new uh, trade data and adjust the nature of the pandemic, this, this time the pandemic, the scale, the in, infectious are much higher and also introduce different measures of the, the quarantine uh, um, measures. And try to see, uh, use regression and, uh, and simulation to see, um, based on the, the, the SARS data, to simulate uh, a synthetic uh, uh, world trade data. Uh, we will do this for China for all the developing countries which we have the data to see um, how this pandemic will impact on their trade. So that is one of the research that we proposed uh, to do. Um, uh, if we can, ha we can have the funding support, but anyway, I think I, I want to do this research. <laughs> I'm committed <laughs> with funding or without. Yeah. Okay. Um then I'm going to take this opportunity as co-chair with Diego to thank Ben and Sholan for their presentations and thank everybody for their questions and discussion and um, call the first of our seminars to a close and look forward to seeing you all in two weeks from now. So, um, you know, all that, all that clapping that usually happens. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Oh, and thank this you. is, like I said, it's going to be recorded, so we'll distribute the link. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Thank Bye. you.